Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast. My name is Dr. Brian Reid, and I'm a naturopathic doctor. And today I am joined by Dr. Stacy Baker. Uh, Dr. Baker is a fellow naturopathic doctor, and I believe she goes by Dr. Stacy. So I'll confirm once we start the interview. But I'm excited to chat with her today. Um, uh, she specializes uh, slash focuses on complex chronic illness in her practice as well. And so I've got a litany of questions that I'll ask her about her um, a take and approach on, you know, a variety of topics related to comp complex chronic illness. So I'm excited to hear what she has to say. Um, she has quite a robust, um, social media presence, um, particularly on Instagram. And, uh, I feel like we're going to have a really great chat. Um, just before I bring her into the recording here, uh, I just want to, um, just go through a quick little plug for my overcoming chronic illness course. Um, if you're not already aware, um, I have a eight part course, um, which is all about overcoming chronic illness. Um, essentially it's a course that I designed to help um, arm uh, patients and their family and friends, caregivers, you know, um, anyone who might be involved um, in their lives and kind of involved in coordinating their care um, to have more information to better navigate the very um, complicated, confusing, challenging waters of complex chronic illness. Um, I get into uh, mold illness, chronic infections, including Lyme and co-infections, heavy metals, other toxins, histamine issues, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, for folks who sign up for my new newsletter, which if you're uh, watching this on YouTube, it's in the comment section below. If you're listening to this on your favorite podcast platform, um, it'll be the link to join the newsletters in the show notes below. And uh, if you sign up for my newsletter, then you get access to the first two modules of the course for free. Uh, the first module is an introduction, which gives a general overview. And then the second module is all about my favorite topic, mitochondrial dysfunction, and not to um, the kind of spoiler alert, but um, pretty much everything, whether it's mold, infections, heavy metals, histamine issues, et cetera, it really all traces back to there being issues with mitochondrial function. So that's arguably the most important module in the entire course. Um, also, if you join my newsletter, then you get the most up-to-date information about when new podcast episodes are launching, when I'm doing live Q&As, and just any other, I uh, just share thoughts that I'm about things that I'm excited about and whatnot um, in my um, in my practice and just kind of new things that are kind of coming onto my radar. So um, uh, if so, if you're interested, please sign up for the newsletter and um, we'll, and, and I hope that you enjoy the course or at least the free modules if you decide to um, check those out. So I will uh, pause the recording now for just a second and be back in just two shakes with Dr. Stacy. All right, everyone, I'm back joined by Dr. Stacy. Dr. Stacy, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, would you mind terribly uh, just telling the folks uh, listening about your background, kind of uh, how you got involved with working with folks with complex chronic illness and uh, just a bit about yourself, please? Sure. Yeah, I'll try to do the express version. But first off, thank you so much for having me um, on your show. And it's always great to connect. Um, so the express version is I dealt personally with a lot of chronic conditions from a very young age, actually. And uh, my parents are both MDs, uh, medical doctors. So um, it was quite interesting how I was the one out of a family of eight that really seemed to snowball and have one thing after the next. And it was never anything that was really, um, you know, of course, disease level, so diagnosable. So it's just these little inklings until it got to be where I started to be a young adult. And then it was, okay, um, it's anxiety, it's hypothyroidism, it's this, it's that, you know, um, you have acid reflux, you have this, you have that. And so I was just constantly thrown prescriptions uh, and things like that. And, you know, for me, I, I always wanted, I was kind of like the worst patient because I was like, you know, tell me what's wrong and I don't want a prescription. And that doesn't sit very well in conventional medicine. Um, and so I think it was just my process in my journey um, that really just led me to get to the point where it's like, I know there's more to our bodies than this. And I know there's more to health than this. And so I'm going to learn everything I can for what, for, to start about like myself and what's going on with me. And, and then I'm going to share it, right. I'm going to share it so I can shorten other people's healing journeys. Um, so that was kind of how I got into it. And I still, you know, you know, there's always so much to learn. The more we learn, the more we realize we really don't know anything, right? We're always mm -hmm. consuming more and more. And so it's just this endless journey that I just love. I soak up everything I can and try to, like I said, help my uh, clients make their journey a lot shorter than mine was to help. 
That's that's great. Yeah, I think every one of my guests and most of my colleagues that I know, like we've all had that background of health issues ourselves. We've all been sitting mm -hmm. in the patient chair, feeling frustrated in the patient chair, or at least not fully satisfied. And it's yeah, yeah kind of that whole trope of the wounded healer. Um, I think uh -huh. it's very true for a reason. So yeah, absolutely. It's great when we can turn that into benefit for other people. So that's that's absolutely. great. Um, well, um, I have a I have a slew of questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. And just before we jump into the first ones, uh, just a general caveat, like with every episode, um, uh, we're not uh, offering any medical advice here today. This is all for informational purposes only. If you need any medical advice, please talk to your personal health care provider to obtain that advice. Um, so with that out of the way, um, I yeah. was um, sifting through some of your social media posts. I've been following you for a little while now on, on Instagram Please. and um and so you had a post recently talking about uh, cell membrane health. And um, actually, a few of my previous guests have talked about um, the importance of cell membrane health. Um, they've kind of uh, extended that to mitochondrial membrane health because, of course, there's uh, a lot of similarities, some, some differences, but a lot of similarities with cell membranes and mitochondrial membranes. And um, I'm just wondering if you could share with listeners what uh, your um, maybe top takeaways would be around, you know, why is cell membrane health important and what are some things that we can do to support cell membrane health? Yeah, the, the easiest way to describe, you know, our cell membranes is that it's basically our barrier, right? Of how, what gets in our cell and what's able to get out of our cell. We have to have fluidity there uh, so that we can move toxins out, we can move nutrients in. And so a lot of times when people have things like mast cell activation or mold toxicity or things like that, we get into what's called a cell danger response. And that's where our cell membranes get, you know, they basically freeze up. And so we, we can't have that fluidity that we need. And so there's lots of things that promote that um, cytotoxicity in the cell. Um, like EMFs and Wi-Fi is one, one of the huge things that we're up against right now. So that, uh, so that really, uh, as far as detoxing goes and, and healing goes, for me, it's one of the things that you really have to do first, because for one, you do have a lot of people in that cell danger response. Um, you have a lot of people with nutrient deficiencies and, and the toxicities that have to move out of the cell, like the heavy metals and, you know, all of these other stealth pathogens that we're dealing with. Um, so kind of fixing that fluidity uh, and without saying, oh, we're going to overdose you on omegas because sometimes that can make your cell membrane too flimsy, right? And so then we have what's called leaky cell. We have leaky everything these days. Um, but it's just about giving it the proper ratio of omegas. And I usually, usually use a phosphatidylcholine to support the cell membrane. And so that's, um, so that we can get that fluidity back so that we can actually start the detoxification process, but you really have to start on a cellular level. That's great. And, um, so kind of on that note, um, and that's a really good point, you know, we kind of think about fish oil is like, oh my gosh, like it's, you just can't go wrong with it, but yeah, you, you don't want to have too much fluidity. It's, it's really mm -hmm. an important point. Um, as far as the phosphatidylcholine side of things goes, do you generally, um, work primarily with phosphatidylcholine kind of full stop or like, I know there's some products out there now, like I think uh, research nutritionals has, you know, their, shoot, I think it's called ATP fuel or something like that. It's got like a bunch of different sort of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like boutique uh, phosphatidyl phospholipids in there, and I I know that there's a lot of interconversion of phospholipids. You kind of hammer in the phosphatidylcholine; it's going to get converted into various other things. But do you ever uh, work with any sort of non phosphatidylcholine phospholipid based supplements, or do you find the I phospholipid don't. does it? I well, feel like the phosphatidylcholine is just like straight into the point. I I see it work the best in in my patients. Sometimes I feel like when you get too fancy. Uh, it's not as, you know, what, what may work really well for one person's constitution may not work for another. And so I think just by having a straight, and I do use it, um, with along with a, a balanced omega as well, so they can work together and synergistically, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not into anything that's too, you know, I like to kind of get straight into the point. Um, and so maybe that's just because that's how I initially was trained in, but you know, I, I do like it just a solid phosphatidylcholine. Great. Yeah. I, to be honest, I've like, I've seen the, I think there's at least one paper, maybe a couple of papers published on, I think maybe it's, I think it's either ATP fuel or 360 ATP or something by research nutritionals. And, um, you know, the, the results look good. It's like, Oh, there's you mm -hmm. know significant improvement in folks, I think with chronic fatigue syndrome or something like that. But mm -hmm. I've kind of pulled some, you know, some of the Facebook groups I'm a part of with other clinicians on there. I've said like, Hey, like who's had good experience with this. And I remember one person chimed in saying it, it's been really, really helpful. And it's like, Oh, great. Like, you know, how many patients have you used it with? Like how 
how often does it help? It's like, well, I've just started using it on myself and it's been like two weeks, but I think it's helping. It's like, ah, like that's, <laughs> that's, you know, that's fine. You know, that's good anecdotal info, but like, you know, sure. I haven't, I haven't clinically, heard anybody, yeah. yeah, I haven't heard anybody talk about it like in a really robust way. So I, I, I kind of like want it to work really well, but I, I just, it's so expensive. It's also challenge, a little bit challenging for us <sighs> to get those products in, in Canada being a US line and we yes. don't have a, a, a distributor here. So but, I don't uh, think it's necessary. You know, yeah. I think it's just, uh, I like sticking to basics as much as possible because it does take you out of that. Like, you know, and when I say basics, that's mostly lifestyle, right? Like, and we can get into that, I'm sure. But, um, but as far as getting into the, I don't feel like there's ever this one fancy supplement that you're missing. Right. I feel like it's just a lot of lifestyle a lot of exposure <laughs> to toxins and things mm-hmm. like that. And then just the basics when it comes to nutrition, that's kind of how I, I, you know, function for the most part. It, it makes a lot of sense. And I will sometimes think like, well, what did, you know, mother nature have in, in mind with this, you know, like did mother nature think, Oh, there's going to, somebody's just going to have to develop in like, you know, the 21st century, some fancy pants, you know, phospholipid complex, or was it like, Oh, there's actually phosphatidylcholine in, you know, eggs and in mm-hmm. duck fat and like a very, you know, variety of different sources. Right. Uh, so right. we're just supposed to kind of eat some of those foods and they're very rejuvenate, you know, revitalizing foods. And maybe our bodies will just use those enzymes to interconvert and, you know, again, nothing against the research nutritional product. Sure. It's helping folks. I mean, there's a time and a place. Yeah, for sure. sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's nice to kind of think about it through that lens of like, what did nature intend? Um, Anytime I do intravenous therapies on my patients, it's like, this is not natural at all. This is as unnatural (laughs) as it gets. It's helping people. So we'll do it, but this is not natural by any stretch of the imagination. So, but uh, I hear you. Yeah. uh, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> um, great. Well, thanks for waxing some philosophy there with me. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, one of the other uh, posts that uh, I took a look at that kind of just, I think folks listening would be very interested in is, um, and, and me too, because man, oh man, um, I've had some difficult SIBO cases in my day. Um, mm. But uh, you had a post about, you know, why does SIBO keep coming back? And mm. uh, would you mind just speaking to why a patient might have like a recurrence of SIBO or, and I'm not sure if you differentiate between, you know, a SIBO that keeps coming back versus a SIBO that won't go away in the first place. So maybe if you don't mind speaking to those two different scenarios, unless, unless they're kind of identical in, in your books in terms of how to troubleshoot them. Yeah, sure. So, you know, when it comes to recurring SIBO and you're, you're right. And it's kind of one of those things. I mean, I think in most, most cases it does lie dormant or, or the balance has been restored for, for some time, but then when it comes back, so I always try to analyze what happened, right? We look at stress because we know stress alone can cause SIBO. So if someone has a very chronically stressed lifestyle that alone can cause uh, gaps in your, in your interstitial lighting. And, and so we know that that's a, a very common cause. What about alcohol or steroid use or, uh, in antibiotic use? Because I see that being a really big cause of recurring, uh, SIBO as well, though, all those three things, those are huge. Um, and then a lot of times there's a missing component of restoring stomach acid you know, you're, you're missing that first line of defense, that first blind barrier. So someone's on a PPI or, you know, stress is causing them to be low stomach acid. They're not supporting with uh, digestive enzymes, things like that. Um, those are kind of the top reasons I see that SIBO recurs. So do I feel like, you know, people do heal from it and, and they sort of relapse? Uh, yeah, I do. Because I think a lot of that is because it's just due to lifestyle. Um, so anytime it comes back, we always assess, and I will tell you, most of the time, it's stress or alcohol. Um, how I have a few follow up questions to that, if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. Um, so, alcohol wise, like how much alcohol are we talking? Like one glass of wine on the weekend, or like two beers every no. day? I think it's more habitual. Uh, yeah. You know, when someone is is drinking on the weekends, you know, and that sort of thing, and then all of a sudden their gut conditions come back, they're bloating again. You know, I mean, alcohol does. Uh, wipe out our microbiome, you know? And so if we are, we maybe just got to that edge where we just had enough of the good and bad balanced out, right? And then we're throwing in alcohol on top of it or, and we're not having our, you know, prebiotics and postbiotics and things like that to support. And we just got there. That can certainly throw you over the edge and, and, and bring you back to those chronic conditions. Right. Um, and just another follow-up question. So, you know, I couldn't agree more with the stress component. Like I, I dare say in this day and age, it's a 
component of everybody's case, whether they have a complex chronic illness or not. Um, but say just, you know, have a, you have a hypothetical patient, um, you've got the right kind of dietary advice in place, the right supplements in place They're let's say they're, you know, exercising, like they're, they're sleep, you know, you're working on sleep hygiene, you're working on mitigating EMF exposure. You got like lots of the pieces of the puzzle in place, mm -hmm. but you see like, man, like you are a ball of stress, like your job's too stressful, or you've got some, you know, acrimony with your, your spouse or your kids are driving you nuts or whatever it is. What would be some of the go-tos that, um, well, would you kind of counsel them through that yourself or would you be referring for amygdala retraining cognitive behavioral therapy you know uh, some other type of counseling like what would your go-tos be to help give somebody advice to start working on that stress yeah so i i feel like i approach this a little bit differently than um you know than most because i think a mindfulness practice to me has been a game changer for my own healing journey. Mm -hmm. And it really has gotten me to a point where my quality of life has gone from here to here. Right. And so, um, you can, you can nudge, right. You can plant the seeds for people to, Hey, a gratitude practice might be super beneficial for you. Like just make a list of 10 things in the morning that you're grateful for. And, and, even if it's, you can't think of anything, you can at least be grateful for your, your air conditioner or your bed, you know, something. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's something that, you know, I try, or I try to say, Hey, you know, take 10 minutes to yourself, uh, get up 10 minutes earlier before the kids get up, like just practice mindfulness to read a book, do something that you love to do. And what's wild is that we live in such a time where that has to be like prescribed by me, right? 10 minutes. That is wild. It's insane, but true. <laughs> but yeah. So now the people who, you know, sometimes it is like, sometimes you have to get a little bit into the work, right? You got to get them on magnesium and you got to get them like, at least like kind of out of that chronic fight or flight somewhat as much as you can. So sometimes you do have to do that before they're kind of, they kind of like wake up and like, oh yeah. I, you know, I enjoyed these small things in nature and, and this and that. So sometimes you do have to calm them down a little. Um, and then for the people who really, I can tell they're just not prioritizing themselves. They're not really doing those stress management things. They're not spending time in nature. They're not getting sunshine, which those are the best healers of all, right? Um, DNRS or Gupta are, are great programs to kind of work with some of that neuroplasticity, rewiring that, um, survival mechanism, that fight or flight response. Um, and that can be really helpful with anxiety, depression, you know, any of those sort of things, because most of that is just a learned condition response to our environment. And so that's why I, I always try to push mindfulness first, because it's like the, if you take yourself out of your environment and you focus on the internal things, then the environment doesn't matter. Right. But it's hard for people. And I know it's hard. It's hard when you're in survival to really put two and two together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, just circling back to the gratitude piece, which I'm it's great that you mentioned that because I've certainly found in my own life, um, having that, you know, it's, it's cliche, but you know, that attitude of gratitude, like it's, yeah. it's so, it's really profound and I haven't really fact checked is. these things, but I mean, I've certainly seen some, you know, social media posts about like, Oh, like, you know, we, we all had like a spirit of gratitude around this glass of water. And then like, you know, the molecules under a high power microscope yeah. look just lovely and form like beautiful snowflakes. And then we were all around the water and we were thinking angry thoughts and like the water just looks really disrupted and various other things like that. So I mean, if that's, you know, um, an objective metric of like gratitude, the, the vibes of that are good for us, you know, that that's one way to look at it. But um, say if you're chatting with one of your um, clients and they're, you're think you're saying to them, like, you know, we should write 10 things you're grateful for, like, say, just as a, as a starting step, um, uh, how do you explain it to them? Like uh, that, this is going to be a good thing for you. Like what's kind of your, uh, your angle that you present if they're just like, okay, I'm like a type A, I'm frazzled. Like, why the heck are you wasting my time writing 10 things I'm thankful for? I feel sick. You hear me? <laughs> like, that's why I'm here. What, what's your uh, kind of explanation for that? If, if you don't mind, like just, yeah, just sort of of it. no, that, that, that totally makes sense. So um, gratitude and, and I would say a meditation or mindfulness practice for me, I try, I tell them like, look, it, kicks you into a parasympathetic state. It takes you out of survival. It def it starts to produce different chemicals, right? Oxytocin, the feel good hormones, you know, those sort of things. And so, you know, if you're starting your day off there, 
And, you know, and, and the other thing is too, if you're normal before your gratitude list was, oh, I got to get the kids ready for school. We got to dash out the door, you know, high cortisol, high stress, high this, high that I'm dreading my day. You know, if you just start to practice it in a calm way, then you're already rewiring a new response. Mm -hmm. And so you're lowering cortisol you're, you're, you're telling your mind, like, you're not going to wake me up like this anymore. Like I'm in charge. This is how I want to wake up. This is how I want to start my day. And so it, it does, it starts to promote a different neurological response. And so whether I tell them, Hey, it's going to lower your cortisol or whatever they're prepared to hear, you know, uh, that's just kind of how I approach it. And it's so much more than that. But if you just break it down to biochemically what's happening, uh, they'll, they'll take that too. <laughs> yep. Fair enough. Yeah. You gotta, gotta know your, your in to, you know, get it, you know, sort of explain it to certain folks, but yeah, I'm, uh -huh. I'm sure it's very nuanced with every individual person. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so kind of on, on that note and, and yet, yet another social media post that was, um, I, I think it was, I think I typed out the direct quote, you know, your body cannot heal in a sympathetic state. So I think this kind of uh, dovetails on that. So, um, let's say taking a patient with complex chronic illness. So, you know, we'll say they've got, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, and fibromyalgia, so lots of like aches and pains and neurological symptoms, the whole nine yards, they've been down and out for like, you know, 15 plus years. Like they're just really, really suffering and they come to your door or doing virtual practice, you know, medicine with you or whatever it happens to be. And so um, in a case like that, where there's clearly, and let's say they have a known history of mold toxicity, you've already got their SIBO test, they're full of SIBO like this, that, there's a ton of like, you know, physiological stuff going on for a mm -hmm. patient like that. Um, so as part of your um, treatment approach, you're talking to them about, you know, being mindful, you know, incorporating the gratitude, you know, sun exposure, et cetera. In terms of the kind of the mindfulness piece of things. Um, just, just, and I'm asking this question so folks listening can kind of have a sense of the context of this. Um, would it be um, fair to say that um, bringing in all the mindfulness work kind of allows the stage to be set so those other therapies that, you know, treating the SIBO, getting their mitochondria on track, supporting their cell memories, et cetera, are going to have a much better chance of working well? Or would it be more fair to say that for a majority of patients, even just the mindfulness itself without even any other treatments would make a significant difference with how they feel? Um, is it is it more of an enabling thing for other therapies to work or is it in and of itself like a core uh, treatment that's actually going to lead to appreciable changes in energy and pain and this and that? Yeah. So that's a really, really good question. And I guess I've never really looked at it that way. To me, it just makes sense, right? Because it's just like that, to, to me, it's getting them out of fight or flight, you know, and, and really in, in calming the nervous system. Um, do I feel like if people just adapted a mindfulness practice first, that a lot of their issues would go away? Absolutely. <laughs> Mm. Absolutely, I do. Um, because you would get your body into a place of homeostasis a lot quicker. Um, so you're going to get into repair mode. You're going to get into that parasympathetic state, that rest and repair. You're going to have better sleep. You're going to, you know, your DNA is going to fold better, you know, like all of these things. Um, so you could go really far if you did that. However, we are in a very allopathic uh, you know, mentality. Uh, and I'm sure it's the same there as well. We, we, we want labs. We want to know what's wrong. We want to check off these boxes and, mm -hmm. and we're going to fix them, you know, because that's what we're taught. We're taught something's wrong and we just check off that list. And so for me, it's important to explain the mechanisms of these practices, but, um, they also will, of course, like you said, make the other things work better because they're still getting into that homeostasis. They're still getting closer to that restful reparative place. So yes, um, you know, it's kind of twofold. Uh, it absolutely does encourage those things to work better, but if they did this first, would they need as much of that? Probably not. Yeah, that's great. And, and I, have to assume that folks listening to this who might like, as I, I, I'm sure you probably run into the same thing with your social media following, um, you know, getting, uh, messages from folks or comments on your post saying like, Oh, like, I, you know, I really want to find a doctor, but like, you know, I can't afford anyone and there's nobody in my area. And maybe there's, I don't, for whatever reason, not a telemedicine option or something. Um, mm -hmm. and it's like, Oh, like it just, it's, it's too expensive to get well. And like, Oh, by golly, you go down a traditional functional medicine route. And it's like, you better have like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to spend on all the lab tests. Yeah. 
testing yeah. and all of that. So yeah. for folks listening who might be thinking like, oh man, like I just, I'd love to do all the fancy pants stuff, all the testing, et cetera, but like, I just can't afford it. Um, yeah. if I'm paraphrasing what you're saying, um, correctly here, um, even just those lifestyle things that they could do, um, could potentially make a significant difference in, in terms of how they feel. It doesn't have to be this expensive, you know, all these supplements, all these tests, like even just the things you can do at home could be quite impactful. Absolutely. They, they are the things that get you to that point and the things that keep you there. So if you're just relying on supplements, then a lot of times you are going to see those recurring and relapsing symptoms, right? Because you never really programmed those lifestyle changes and you never really assumed your identity as uh, a healthy person. So we have these constructs, you know, in our mind mentally and the, we don't have the habits to back them up. And so that's why we see a lot of relapsing issues. And so a lot of that is that, um, you know, that meant, I always say the mentality of a sick person, uh, is, is one of the root causes of a lot of chronic illness. Mm. Well, I, I can definitely say from my own experience, I've had a number of patients where, you know, they've improved a lot, like with, um, you know, the right, you know, getting rid of the mold, treating the infections, getting rid of the SIBO, et cetera, et cetera, you know, making a lot of those changes. And, but I've had a number of patients, quite a few where, you know, they maybe get to like the 75, 80% better point, And then they kind of hit a plateau. And sometimes it's because we haven't figured out the next thing. Um, but mm -hmm. in many cases it's that, you know, it's around that time. It's like, well, let's really look, are you actually, you know, exercising? Like, you know, have we delved into your sleep enough? Like what's happening with mm -hmm. your diet? We kind of revisit that. Um, and, and in these same patients, it's like, oh, I'm like 75, 80% better. But then when I try to wean off of, you know, all of my supplements or a significant number, like I start to backslide as kind of, as you were saying, it's like, we're, mm -hmm. we're supplementing them with these things, um, to bolster them, but it, it's really, it doesn't replace, you know, it's a supplement. It's not a replacement, um, for, sure. um, you know, all these healthy lifestyle habits. So I think it's a really good point to bring up and, um, yeah, just the synergy with the treatments that we, you know, folks might be, you know, working with it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a win-win really to bring mm -hmm. these things into the mix. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank, thanks for, uh, yeah, thanks for chatting about this with me. This is uh, mm -hmm. yeah, really, really important. I'm going to uh, switch gears here a little bit just so we can cover some other topics. I'm, I never yeah. get through my question list and I'm not going to <laughs> with you either, but uh, we'll, we'll do our best. Um, so uh, one of the things you mentioned earlier, which was one of the questions I was going to ask you about is um, trying to find the, oh, there, there's the question now. Um, it uh, was just about stomach acid. So I saw in um, at least a couple of your posts, if not, not a few um, that you mentioned low stomach acid. So I'm just wondering mm -hmm. how you you um, test for that and um, how that's treated um, when you identify low stomach acid? I don't test for it because it, it's, it's pretty apparent, you know, when someone's had long withstanding heartburn or acid reflux or even silent reflux um, and, or low, just low minerals across the board, you, we know there's an absorption issue. So anytime there's an absorption issue, or even I would say like, I, even the, the SIBO cases, the bloating cases and things like that, to me, we have to support digestion from the top down. Um, and that, you know, not only starts with our, uh, stomach acid, but that's our digestive enzymes. That's, you know, our oral microbiome. You have to think about all of those things, right. Our sinuses, those all affect what's going down our GI tract. Mm -hmm. Um, the digestion from the top down for sure. Now, obviously if there's H pylori involved, you're not going to want to give, um, straight, uh, HCL because that mm. feeds H pylori. So we don't want to do that, but we are always supporting with digestive enzymes or bitters, no matter who it is. And then if it's low stomach acid with no H pylori, I generally do a betaine HCL like challenge where we titrate mm. up, uh, get to that dose where they know, okay, this is my, this is my number. And then we, we bring it back down. So it's like, kind of like a one, one time ditch effort where you got to kind of go there, titrate it. And that way you're not on them forever. You can always support with digestive enzymes forever, but that really gets you to a good, healthy level of stomach acid for, for most people. And then they don't have to worry about it again. Um, so, sorry, you're saying that you kind of get them on stomach acid, like betaine HCL, um, mm -hmm. plus, plus or minus bitters, and then kind of do that for a period of time, um, just to kind of like top up their levels, so to speak. And then, 
Yeah. So, so usually I do that um, without bitters. So if they're doing an HCL sort of protocol, mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll do just the betaine HCL for a few days. Um, and sometimes, sometimes they get up. And so my mentality is they titrate up until they have a point where they know like, this is my level. And you can tell because you'll start having immediate heartburn or, or belching or something like that. And then, so from there you titrate back down and I have people that get up to like 12 caps Mm -hmm. uh, which just shows how deficient they really are. Right. And then they come back down and then all of a sudden they're digesting their food better. They're not bloating. And so after that kind of HCL protocol, that's when we'll add in the bitters or enzymes just to keep that going, you mm -hmm. know, to keep kind of, and then of course there's a lot of things you can do with foods and things like that to promote digestive enzymes. But, um, for most people, when they have gut issues, I like to kind of support the whole time we're doing a protocol. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think maybe where I got confused when you were saying you titrate back down, that's like going to be a gradual titration, like as their mm -hmm. body tells you like, oh, I'm on this dose, it was fine. And then, oh, now it's giving me heartburn immediately. I dropped the dose down. And yes. I walk it yes. Down like that. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So it just takes a little bit. It usually takes about two weeks for most people, just a little bit of intuition and focus to make sure they get to that dose and then come back down. And then it really, then you don't have to worry because some people take, um, the betaine HCL like indefinitely. Mm. And I'm like, I, for one, you could be taking such a low dose. It's not even really doing what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I like to build up those stomach acid levels initially because it's like, why, how are we going to work on parasites and bacteria and things like that? If you still have this open door with no, uh, no stomach acid to protect mm -hmm. against more coming in. So I like to kind of make sure that barrier is, uh, there before we do the deeper work. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And it, it's really important. And quite frankly, like, I don't know, I don't hear a lot. I'm just thinking now, I don't really hear a lot of other clinicians like kind of out there in the public space or like at conferences or whatnot, really talking about stomach acid a whole lot, like mm -hmm. some do, of course, but, um, I know personally in my own practice, I probably had like, maybe I'd say 20 ish or so patients, like where they did everything, like they were treated for SIBO, LIBO, parasites, like everything like on megadose enzymes, every diet under the sun. And like the thing that was missing was like, oh, you're just low on stomach acid. And like, after <laughs> exactly. all that, like the betaine hydrochlor is like the yes. cheapest, easiest thing. And yes. yeah, like, that's what was missing. Um, yep. so it, it's really yeah. important to not forget about it. Um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Shoot, I was going to ask you something else about that now. I got too excited. Oh, right. Uh, it was just just a silly little <laughs> anecdote. And not that it's a competition or anything, but I've had uh, two patients that got up to 30 capsules before they got Oh, my um, gosh. Yeah, yeah, wow. That's very, wild. Very rare, but yeah, just wild. Were they on a PPI? No. Wow. I know. It was crazy. That's, yeah, either they that is like, crazy. I think like 12 and 15 is high. Like, it that's is. Wild. Oh, it is. That's crazy high. It's yeah, like a bottle. Is. <laughs> what's, that, what's that sorry that's like a whole bottle i know yeah and it was it was back in the day where i used to say like, oh take as much as you can tolerate until your body tells you to drop it down and um so yeah the she was going through like a bottle every few days it was it was oh, wild. oh wow yeah, was that is good. crazy yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, anyways oh yeah that was just a little little fun little anecdote um yeah uh let's see it actually maybe just one more thing about the stomach ass because i i think mm -hmm. about this uh, semi-regularly because I see it so much in practice, but, um, when I have patients who are like, say they're kind of stuck on like a, a relatively high therapeutic dose of stomach acid, like, Oh, if I go lower, like I start to get more symptoms again. Um, one of the biggest, uh, reasons I see for that circling back to what we talked about earlier is stress. Um, stress is a, mm -hmm. a factor. So of course, you know, when you're in sympathetic mode, you're not in rest and digest, you're in, you're in fight or flight. Um, and so that, that I think is a big factor. Um, are mm -hmm. there other factors beyond, um, stress that you've seen kind of contribute to more of like a chronic low stomach acid issue? Um, I think just, uh, you know, mineral imbalances, of course, and then, and, and then stealth pathogens, so parasites, you know, uh, things that haven't been addressed yet. And sometimes, sometimes you can't get stomach acid levels to where they need to be until the H pylori is gone, right? Until you find that balance in the gut and things like that. So I'd say it's usually stealth pathogen related or just like the imbalance in minerals. Uh, sodium is a huge one. Uh, really, you know, people are really low in sodium. It's going to affect your stomach acid levels. Mm -hmm. Um, well, that's actually a great segue into another question I have for you just about parasites, because uh, you had several posts about parasites. Um, yeah. And um, so with parasites, um, 
uh, well, and, and maybe you have a different point of view on this. I'd love to hear it. Um, generally, what I've seen from looking at the research literature and what I've heard from you know the majority of folks at conferences, et cetera, um, there's really uh, laboratory testing for parasites is not very reliable. Um, it's not very good at picking up the parasites. It gives false negatives a lot of the time. Um, and uh, so I guess two-part question one is, would you agree with that? Or do you have a different experience? Do you know about a magical lab that can test for things more effectively? And uh, how do you, um, if you don't have a reliable lab to tell you to treat, then uh, do you do a therapeutic trial of, of some sort to look for parasites? Yeah, so I don't believe there is a good lab because the um, for one, they're if they're they're testing. I've I've had uh, clients take in a sample that clearly has parasite in the stool, mm -hmm. and it still comes back negative, and you Me can too. see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So weird, so weird. Yeah, it's okay. But what but what people need to understand is they're testing for like eighty species or something on most mm -hmm. tests, and and there are literally like millions at this point. And so the only test I've seen that like kind of test for a lot is from Germany. I ha have a patient out of Germany that was like, mm -hmm. I know I have parasites and by God, I'm going to find them. And so they did, but I think it was all experimental and they did test for like at least a couple thousand wow. different parasites. Wow. Yeah. She That's was really crazy. trying to, I mean, she was determined and she was I really, guess. she knew something was up, you know, and a lot of times people are going to just kind of gaslight you and say, Oh, your test is negative, you know? Um, so no, I don't test. Um, and, and sorry, it's not Dr. Worth Susie, it. if could I, if I interrupt for just one mm -hmm, sec? I just sure. I know some listeners are going to be like, "Well, what's the lab like?" Can because they're like, "I'm going to find that parasite too." Um, is it a commercially available test, or was she calling in a favor? From no, some, uh, it German was actually yeah, from? it was actually at a university in Germany, so oh, it's not wow. something that people okay. can find. But yeah. it's not even if it was available, just just run through parasite work. You know you. what I mean? I we you. all yeah. have them, like it's going to be thousands of dollars to find a decent parasite test. So it's like, um, just, we all have them. Let's just find yeah. balance with them, you know? So. Um, and just, and just on that note, um, could you just kind of qualify, like, um, like you said, like we all have them, like what would the clinical signs or symptoms be that we all have them? And how would you know that you've kind of purged them from your body successfully with an anti-parasite protocol? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, we're more bacteria than we are human cells. And so it is really important to know that if there is an imbalance in bacteria or parasites and, you know, parasites aren't always just worms. And I think people think, you know, a lot of times they are, but I think a lot of times people think like, oh, third world countries, worms and all these things, but we have intracellular parasites. Uh, we, you know, they don't just stay in the gut. So a lot of parasite protocols are just in the gut. So that's not really going to get you where you need to be. Um, some of the most common parasite symptoms, I would say, um, are, of course, any sort of neurotransmitter uh, imbalance because things like serotonin make uh, parasites a lot more active. And so uh, insomnia comes right along with that. So uh, they are more active. They increase our cortisol at night. And so for people who can't sleep, you're going to have that increase in cortisol. Um, that can certainly be a factor. Of course, nutrient deficiencies because they're going to steal our nutrients. Um Teeth grinding at night can be a really telltale sign. Um, so those are kind of like the big heavy hitters. Uh, and then, you know, the way I try to tell people to be intuitive is, um, you know, are your symptoms getting worse around the full moon? Because parasites are, are more active around the full moon. So if that is a thing and you feel like your anxiety, depression, insomnia, um, GI issues, things like that get worse around the full moon, that's going to be a pretty clear sign that we need to find some balance. And so it is all about finding balance. Are we ever going to get rid of all the bacteria in our body? No, because then we wouldn't be here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's just getting to the place where you check off those symptoms, right? Where you're balanced in your mood and you're balanced with your energy and you get good sleep and things like that. And then do things more seasonally to keep that balance in check so that you don't go backwards and start having a lot of those things. So, you know, I would recommend to my patients after they're done working with me is do, do one every season, you know, spring, summer, fall, winter, just run through one. And they, they honestly like them by the time they're done with me, they like doing the full moons. And so mm. they're like, yeah, let's keep up with this, you know? Yeah. That's great. Um, and sorry to yourself and anyone listening. If you hear my smallest child crying in the background, uh, I apologize for the noise interference. 
I got my time zones mixed up. So I thought I was going to be doing this at work earlier today, not in my oh. this, this evening, but it's all working out just great, except you know, uh, I didn't for... even notice. No, okay, good. maybe it's... I'm used to it. <laughs> that could be it. Or it's this wonderful microphone we were talking about it, earlier. I didn't even like, hear it. <laughs> I should really try to get them to sponsor the podcast because I'm talking up this, uh, this snowball so much. Um, so uh, just one little interesting anecdote. I don't know if you saw this or not, but there was a study somebody put out, um, you know, some time ago, and it was basically saying like, you know, bruxism, i.e. tooth grinding, um, is this really a sign that people have parasites? And basically the authors, and maybe I was superimposing some things here, but like it kind of sounded like they're being a bit snooty saying like, this is just rubbish, you know, there's no correlation there. Um, and they did some study and sound like there was no correlation with increased tooth grinding with parasites. And yet at the same time, it's like, the testing is really awful for it. Like, how did you know? It's like, oh, we tested these people with tooth grinding. There were no parasites. Like, what test did you use? Do you have this magical <laughs> German university test? Like, no, you don't. You have, you know, highly, highly insensitive testing. And like, how can you yes. make this correlation? But I, I've certainly seen the tooth grinding. Like, oh man, I had this one little, this pediatric patient. I think she was three or four at the time. And she was tooth grinding so loud. She was like keeping her whole family awake at night. And it wasn't yeah. until we, you know, treated for parasites and it yeah. went away. So my daughter uh, too. I oh, mean, really? my daughter is, you know, she is going to get in those creeks and play and everything else. And I know that's got to be where she has picked up something, but yeah, she was, she was grinding pretty hard. And I know that's what it was. So we do full moons pretty often with them. It's, it's not a bad practice to be in. No. Know? Yeah. Um, so I know at this point, all this talk of parasites, uh, if it hasn't ruined everybody's dinner, um, I know they're definitely wondering how, oh, are we still good? Oh yeah, we're so yeah, good. Okay, Sorry, perfect. Hannah. Just saw your screen flicker. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. Um, I know everyone's probably wondering, like, so how how do you treat for parasites? So um, could you just kind of speak to some of the general principles or the types of tools that you would use to treat parasites during these uh, full moon cleanses? Yeah, absolutely. So I I do use herbals. I'm not sure if you are familiar with Cellcore. That's my favorite brand for anti-parasitic yep. work. Yeah, Is yeah. that what you use too? Yeah. Uh, I I'm familiar with the products. I, I don't use those ones specifically, but I have a number of patients who have been on them. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so I always say though, before you jump to parasites, it's really important to make sure your drainage pathways are open because if you're chronically constipated or if you can't sweat or can't move things out or your lymph is stuck or things like that, it's really important to make sure that your body can move things out first because you can get sicker and parasites release a lot of nasty things when you're getting rid of them, like heavy metals and, um, you know, just uh, retroviruses and things like that. So it's really important to make sure for one, you can move things out. Um, and then the other thing is I, um, I, I like to use, um, like I said, the herbals, I like self core um, because they don't just focus on what's in the gut. They, the herbals that will go like into the bloodstream, right. And grab some of those, um, intercellular parasites and things like that. So that's why I, I really like those, um, you know, and, and for people who don't have self core things like black walnut hull, um, some of those kind of things are going to be, are going to be really supportive, obviously to, uh, to do some anti-parasite work. And the thing is it's for me, I like working around that full moon, because the body releases things in waves, right? And so if we're working with the moon when they're, they're most active, you're going to get more out of it. So, and because it is hard to put the body through a six month, you know, parasite cleanse, right? If you're passing for that long, that's a lot of stress. It's a lot of cortisol. Um, so if you can do it in waves, the body's going to release more and it's not going to be as stressful in the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you definitely don't want to like throw the baby with the bathwater and, you know, just, mm -hmm. or yeah, throwing, or should rather throwing the patient's body to the wolves, like, oh, I just muscle through this for six months. That's, right. Yeah, that's right. Pr pretty rough. Um, um, one of the things that I found that uh, the cell core folks, because they, they, they rebranded from microbe labs, right? They, they used to mm -hmm. be that that's correct. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. same, same, same company just rebranded. Um, one of the things that they really brought to the, um, popularized, I guess, within certain circles, um, was the mimosa pudica, um, mm -hmm. which I know in my own practice, like before when I thought, okay, I've got to put a patient on a par anti-parasite protocols, like, oh gosh, like we're going to just need to mega dose these anti-parasitics because it was just really tough sometimes to treat. And then once mimosa pudica came into my life and my patient's lives, I was like, oh, this has made the thing so much easier. I'm just wondering yes. if that's something that you feel is a core component of an anti-parasite protocol, given using cell course, I'm assuming yes, but uh, would you mind speaking mm -hmm. to the importance of mimosa uh, pudica? 
Yeah, the way I the way I explain it is it it's kind of like it's like a sticky seed, right? And if you put it in water, you're gonna see that it really stretches out and, and it gets really sticky. And so what it does is it gets in that GI tract and really pulls things out on the on the way out. So you take your parasite products and then you take that mimosa pudica seed to come kind of right behind it. And then you're really working you know, synergistically to make sure that you're getting everything in the biofilm, all of those things out of the digestive tract. It's just been, it's been so amazing. I, I had a patient the other day tell me they passed like a five foot long something or the other. Yeah. The other, uh, the last full moon. And I'm like, yeah, that wasn't Pudica seed. (laughs) That was... (laughs) Uh definitely something that has been with you for a long time it's wild (laughs) yeah Yeah, along being the keyword there that's uh (laughs) better wrote than in but man oh man that's might need some dnrs after that that's a little traumatizing i think yeah (laughs) Yeah. um yeah no it's it's been i describe it to my patients in a very similar way and um i I usually describe it as spider-man webbing like it's just it gets Mm -hmm. so sticky like or for folks who aren't familiar if you've ever played with it in water before like some weirdos like us probably have um, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's kind of like when you soak chia seeds but if the chia seeds just all stuck mm-hmm. together and became like yeah. basically like spider-man webbing that's, yeah. that's essentially what it is and yeah it's yeah. just it's so unique like i've i um reached out to my the company where we buy a lot of our herbs from uh because we make our own herbal tinctures and i said like do you guys have any do you know of any other herb that has similar properties because like i've just never come across anything that's even close to like having that property to it and i I haven't found anything else like it before. Um, like yeah. if we ever lost access to mimosa, like I don't know what I would use to replace it. So I know, yeah. I know it is, well, it is hopefully really we good. Never lose it. Yeah. yeah, we won't. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I'm not anticipating we will just, I, I've been around long enough where like, there's some products that I was like, Oh, I used to rely on that. Now we don't have access to it anymore. So yes, uh, yeah, a, hoping for the best, uh, planning for the worst, but anyways, yes, for ho- sure. Hopefully mimosa will be with us for a long time. Um, yes. <clears throat> Well, uh, we're, we're kind of rounding the bend on our time together, Dr. Stacy. And um, I've, um, if you don't mind, I've got, uh, got a few rapid fire questions for you. I've kind of just, sure. um, uh, you're the first uh, interviewee that I'm, I'm going to try these out on if you don't mind, but okay. I, I, think they'll be, yeah. I think they'll be kind of fun and uh, we'll see how it goes. And if it's not good, well, I don't edit my video. So we're just going to have to deal with the <laughs> aftermath, I guess. It is what it um, is. <laughs> th- thanks for being a good sport. Okay. So uh, here we go. So um, if you could only prescribe three supplements slash slash therapies, so like if you're whole, yeah, speaking of losing access to things, so you could only have yeah. like three supplements or therapies mm-hmm. for, you know, the rest of your practice career, heaven forbid, um, what would those uh, top three therapies be? Um, or, or so, supplements. so like lifestyle or supplements or both? You, it's, it's a fairly open question. Yeah. Okay. So, um, obviously mindfulness practice has my heart. Um, that, like uh, magnesium is my yes. favorite and, uh, methylated B complex. Those are my yes. three favorites. Okay. That's, <laughs> those are good choices. Yeah. yeah. Magnesium would definitely be on my top three list too. It's the, you can't live without it. Um, in terms of the methylated bees is, uh, that from a, um, for, for what perspective, uh, would that be, um, on your top? You know, we're, list? we're to the point where we're getting to be close to 60% of the population having the MTA, MTHFR mutation. So mm-hmm. it's just for overall methylation support, your B vitamins are going to support that they're going to support energy, liver detox, all the things. So that's going to be up there for sure. Fair enough. Yep. Great. Uh, let's see. Next one. Sorry. Kids are being so loud. Up here. I'm glad you guys <laughs> not, it's not loud. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay. If, um, what are some supplements or therapies that, oh, right. Yeah. So what are some supp- supplements or therapies that didn't uh, pan out the way you hoped they would? So it was like the latest and greatest. And you're like, I was so excited about this. And I tried it with half a dozen patients or a dozen patients and man, it was a swing and a miss. Um, any, anything you were I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say anything new per se, um, but I would say anytime I try to incorporate just some bioidentical uh, like progesterone or something like that and like the stress is still there and the cortisol is still there, mm-hmm. it's just it's it's just not worth anything. You know, it's really not worth anything. So I, I would say uh, hormone problems are usually never not hormone problems, they're usually cortisol problems. So I think that's that's probably the only the only thing I've like, yeah, I know how to dose this and whatever, but it just doesn't really do anything. Hmm. Not if you're not addressing those lifestyle things that are really just draining that progesterone. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. 
uh, let's see here. And uh, what are you the most excited about in medicine slash health right now? I am, I am, I'm excited because I think there's a lot more awareness of um, the power of the mind when it comes to healing and in and, and the subconscious. And like I said, the neuroplasticity and the rewiring and all of those things, I think it's finally coming to light and finally people are seeing, uh, you know, the value when it comes to healing. And so I think there is, it's such an exciting time to be in this field right now anyway, because there's just such an awareness, right? There's such a population that is like, I want to take back my health and I'm so sick of people gaslighting me. So just being a mm -hmm. part of that is just like, it's the best time. That's a good answer. That's great. Um, and uh, what are you in the process of learning about or looking into right now from a from a health um, or medicine perspective? Um, you know, for me, I, I always I'm always taking continuing ed classes and just stuff I want to learn more about. Um, I am learning a little bit more about um, methylation SNPs and things like that. Even though for me, I. I don't put a lot of focus on genetics because for me, it's more important to what are those triggers, you know, what are those triggers? But if, you know, if there is a very specific mutation, like I just said, the MTHFR is so common now, we know we just need more folate, basically more B complex mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, but looking into some of the other ones like COMPT, you know, and things like that, I, I'm, I always want to learn more about those sort of things. So. Cool. Uh, what uh, kind of learning, like, uh, who are you uh, learning about that stuff from, like a particular CE source? I'm, I'm mostly just asking for me because I'm a CE oh, product as well. So just wonder. Yeah, no, I, um, I'm i just doing my own research on it right oh, now. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no actual structured class on that right now. I, I took, so my last continuing education classes I took were at Harvard and I um, did some biochemistry and some Im immunology um, through Harvard. And so for now that kind of like, like <laughs> that was a lot uh -huh. for my brain. So now I'm like, I don't have time to commit to a structured thing right now, but, um, but yeah, just anytime I have free time, I do commit at least an hour or so a week to just like, you know, researching and coming up with my own thing. Yeah, that's good. It's important. It keeps it fresh too. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, with, with the comp just, uh, as a, point of interest. Um, I've seen like a lot of clinical positives with um, supporting the comp when folks have mutations there, like B6, you know, P5P, yes. uh, magnesium, like it's been a big game changer for some patients, like where, you know, we try like everything else under the sun to like help with their anxiety symptoms or this or that. And, you know, like that's what seems to really move the needle a lot. So just, just yes. FYI, it's been, yeah, really absolutely for some people. So, mm -hmm. um, and very last uh, rapid fire question, if you don't mind, um, what would you say your top, uh, one to three, uh, uh, favorite functional lab tests are? Oh yeah. Um, so I love the organic acid from great plains. It's mm -hmm. my favorite organic acid. Um, so that is my, it's like the test that tells you everything, but nothing at the same time. Right. <laughs> it's just like little indicators. Of what... <laughs> 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 I don't know if that would be their selling line, but it's true. It's true. Yeah. It's so true. <laughs> uh, you have to know how to read it, you know, you and you have you to do. know that these are just little nudges of things being off, right? It's not like a diagnosable thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that is my very favorite. I'm really loving the Total Toxin Lab from Vibrant. I don't know if you all have Vibrant in Canada. I just had a patient uh, where we we got our first Vibrant kit, but I, I'm not aware of all of the the full spectrum. So please please tell us and me yeah. about what what that one's all about. Sure, you might want to get hooked up. I feel like they do ship to all most all most every company or country, but mm. um, they have a Total Toxin Lab that looks at mycotoxins. Um, heavy metals through urine, which I, I usually like to look at it through hair, but this, but it will show me if there's a, an acute exposure, right? If it's in urine. So heavy metals and radioactive elements, which is amazing. Um, and then it will also look at environmental toxicities. And so uh, parabens, phthalates, um, you know, VOCs, uh, organophosphates, pesticides, all these things that can really, BPA, uh, dioxins, things like that, that can really help you, you know, for someone who's like, oh yeah, I live a clean lifestyle. And you're like, wait a minute, your BPA uh -huh. is like through the roof. Like obviously your body can't move that out if it's not a current exposure. Um, 
or maybe you're missing something. So looking at that, and it's been mind blowing because I see people test with things like DDT, which hasn't been sprayed since the 1960s. Wow. So that shows you how long those things live in our ground and, and that sort of thing. So, so great plains, total toxin. And then I like the old school HTMA. I love it. And that's the hair tissue mineral analysis. Mm -hmm. It's a very analog test compared to some of these new flashy tests, but Mm -hmm. gosh, it gives you your electrolytes, your minerals. It gives you a three month trend. It tells you your, how your thyroid and adrenals are managing your stress and assessing your stress load and what, how your body's reacting to it. Those are so powerful. And so those are my, I would, those are my top three for sure. Okay, great. Well, thank you for doing the rapid fire questions and of course. lots of fun. So that was yeah, great. Yeah, it was um, great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good, good. Well, um, Dr. Stacy, just as we're wrapping up here, um, thank you so much for sharing all this uh, knowledge with us. Um, can you, uh, like folks who are listening thinking, you know, I'd like to, I'd like more Dr. Stacy in my life. Um, can you tell us about where they can find you <laughs> on social media? Do you have online courses if they want to work with you directly, um, or other offerings that you have, would you mind just speaking to that? And I'll, I'll put any of the links or whatnot in the show notes. Sure. Yeah. So I put most of my effort into one social media platform right now, and that's Instagram. So you can find me at dr.stacy.nd. Um, I'm sure you can link that up. And then I do have my own podcast as well. It's just me. I don't have guests. Um, and that's vibing well with Dr. Stacy. Um, and I post bi-weekly ish on there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, I am creating courses this year, so that's going to be something fun. So definitely stay tuned. I'll release those on Instagram. I'm going to create not only for the population, but also for practitioners only. So I'm going to have some courses coming out this year and then, um, I'm writing a book. I just signed a book deal. So I'm going to be writing a book and that's going to be more on the, um, the, you know, some of the more mindfulness type things when it comes to healing and, and and change and, and why we can't really get to where we want to be. So we're going to be talking about some of the physical, you know, uh, barriers and social barriers and conditioning and all of that thing. So lots of things coming up this year. (laughs) You're a busy beaver. That's great. I am. I love it. (laughs) That's great. Well, um, so, and, uh, you have a a website as well, I would ascertain. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. By wellness.biz. Okay. Great. So I'll link um, all those up in the show notes. And um, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It was thanks really for great. having me. Yeah. Well, um, thanks so much to everyone who listened to this episode. Um, we hope that it was wonderful and informative for you. And until next time, um, we'll, we'll, well, oh my goodness. <laughs> Apparently, I shouldn't podcast this late in the day. Um, um, I hope that uh, we'll see you at the next um, Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast episode.